Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for equipping us through your word to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. It is our desire to hear your word, receive it, and respond to it in obedience. Where our desire falters, we ask for courage. Where our will is weak, we ask for strength. Speak to us, we pray, the word of conviction, of encouragement, of comfort, or of teaching that we most need to hear. For you alone know our hearts. Amen. So last week we learned that the United Kingdom under David and Solomon did not last very long. The kingdom was split into two and there was the northern tribe of Israel and the southern tribe of Judah. Most of our biblical history was written by the southern tribe. And so all the northern kings, they were terrible kings. And it's not that they weren't. It's just that the southern kings weren't much better. Anyway, today's story is during the time, as Kathy said, of Israel's king Ahab and the prophet Elijah. And Ahab really was a terrible king. He married the Phoenician queen Jezebel, who did not like God's people and who worshipped Baal. Now, Baal was the storm god, according to the mythology of the Baal cult, and was responsible for bringing life-giving rains at certain times of the year and thus restoring fertility to the land. But there had been a drought for three years. Enter the prophet Elijah, who Jezebel cannot stand. He says it is not Baal who is in control, but the Lord. And he challenges Jezebel, Baal, and all those who would follow them. Listen to the word of the Lord in 1 Kings chapter 18. So Ahab sent to all the Israelites and assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. Elijah then came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal then follow him. The people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets number 450. Let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, put no fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, put no fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire is indeed God. All the people answered, well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many. Then call on the name of your God, but put no fire to it. So they took the bull that was given them, prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, crying, Oh, Baal, answer us! But there was no voice and no answer. They limped about the altar that they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud! Surely he is a god. Either he's meditating, or he's wandered away, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. Then they cried aloud, and as was their custom, they cut themselves with swords and lances until the blood gushed out over them. As midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice, no answer, and no response. Then Elijah said to all the people, come closer to me. And all the people came closer to him. First, he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes 
of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Then he made a trench around the altar, large enough to contain two measures of seed. Next he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood. He said, fill four jars of water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time, and they did it a second time. Again, he said, do it a third time, and they did it a third time so that the water ran all around the altar and filled the trench also with water. At the time of the offering of the oblation, the prophet Elijah came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your bidding. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, and even licked up the water that was in the trench. When the, all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord indeed is God. The Lord indeed is God. The word of God for the people of God. The last time I preached this passage, I focused on the purpose for its writing. Yahweh, the Lord, is the one true God. Remember our passage several weeks ago where we learned the Shema from Deuteronomy? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. The people had fallen away from God, forgetting all about a relationship with God, with all of their heart and soul and might. They forgot about all in discipleship. And we will get back to this message, for it is we all need to hear over and over again because we so easily get distracted from all in discipleship. However, the one true Elijah seems to fail to model disciple here. He makes fun of the other prophets of Baal. He challenges them and he has this huge dramatic scene to put them into place. Well, our Christian teaching tells us to love our neighbor, but it also tells us to love our enemy. We are encouraged not to foster a holier-than-thou attitude, certainly not to goad and taunt others who have a different set of beliefs to our own. Quite frankly, aside from the truths, of the place of God over and above the place of the false gods. Elijah's taunting and goading to those who had not discovered enough about God to believe in God is a little over the top. Not everything is included in our scripture as an example of how to act in the presence of others or how to promote our God and our faith over them. However, the purpose and the point of this story is just as true today. We have many idols in our day. When it comes to our devotion, God wants to have first place. Not because God is needy or insecure, but because God created us, because God loves us, and because we belong to God. You know, God sees the whole big picture. 
But sometimes we get focused in on just a little part. And God knows what we need better than we do ourselves. When we put something before God and before our relationship with God, that becomes our idol. When we are devoted to something or someone more than we are devoted to God, that is an idol. And idols get in the way of our relationship with God and will continue to get in the way until, by God's grace, we realize we've put in the place of God. We realize we're going the wrong way, away from God, and we repent. We repent of becoming our own little G-God, of worshiping ourselves and other things. And we realize we're empty because nothing can fill us as God's love can. Nothing gives our life meaning as knowing we are a loved child of God. And when the Holy Spirit convicts us of our wrongdoing and we repent, we do a 180, we stop going away from God and turn and go toward God. The problem with the emotional, dramatic conversions that took place with the contest between the prophets of Baal and Elijah, Elijah who thought he was the only prophet of God, which by the way is not true, Elijah just wasn't aware of the other prophets of the Lord, and in his devotion to himself and his woe is me attitude, I, I alone in here, he wrongly thought that he was the only one following the Lord. Anyway, the conversions of that day, many were short-lived because a relationship with the one true Lord is not sustained and does not grow on the mountaintop where everything is wonderful. Our relationship with God grows when we have faith and trust the Lord even when there seems to be no way, even in the valley of the shadow of death. But even Elijah had a hard time trusting and walking by faith. When things got tough, do you know what Elijah did after that fantastical display? Well, Queen Jezebel, as you might imagine, was not happy and she ordered that Elijah be killed. So after Elijah had witnessed this miraculous display of God's power, do you know what he did? He fled. He hid. He felt sorry for himself. And he asked that God would even take his life. Read the next chapter, 1 Kings 19. It's awesome. Elijah hides. But... God. But God meets him where he is. And it's not in the strong wind or the earthquake or the fire that Elijah turns back to God, but in the silence. Be still and know that I am God. On our tree that has been divided, to demonstrate the divided kingdom and now this contest between God and Baal. We see many things that are idols in our lives. Kathy mentioned with the children, Facebook, money, any kind of screen time, phone, tablet, TV, computer, food, other substances, things that in and of themselves are not bad, but when they have our devotion over and above our devotion to God, that is sin. That is a block to our relationship with God. 
Do you know what sin does? It numbs us to God's truth. First John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Sin will numb us to God's truth. We need to repent and return to the one who loves us and fills our hearts and souls that then are not left feeling empty. The other half of our tree shows things that can help us in our relationship with God. Worshiping together with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Fellowshipping together. Serving together. Praying. Reading the Bible. Studying the Bible together. Being the people of God and doing the work of the people of God. Help us to grow in our relationship with God. Now, you know what? You can take any of those things on the blue side, and they can become an idol, too. You can say, oh, I've got to read my Bible this morning. Da -da 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 -da. Check, done, gone. You did it. But you didn't do it with your heart and your mind and your soul. It's when we follow these disciplines with our heart and our mind that we grow in our relationship. Today, we celebrate All Saints Sunday. We remember our loved ones that have died since last All Saints Day. And I wonder, what would they say to us if they could? And maybe they can. Would they remind us how precious life is? Would they encourage us to break away from our idols and all that keep us from God so that we would return to God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? They are healed. They have been made new in God's presence. They are wrapped in God's love. And don't you imagine they want us to experience that too? Well, that's the amazing thing about God's kingdom. We can experience that. Not as perfectly as they do, but God is with us. God does make us whole and well so that we can sing it is well with my soul. No matter the circumstances of our lives, we are wrapped in God's love now and forever. Amen. <laughs>